Well, would you please open your Bibles with me to Romans 15? Romans 15. We come this morning to verse 14. You'll find this on page 949 if you're using one of the Bibles from the seat rack under uh, the chair in front of you or just down a seat or two from you. And I trust that all of you will open a copy of the Word of God so that you can follow along with us this morning. Two weeks ago, we looked at Romans 15, verses 8 through 13, and exploring in particular, digging into the the main idea from those verses that our Lord Jesus Christ himself is on a mission. Now, he is God's chosen servant. That's part of the concept that's, that's wrapped into the idea that he is the Messiah. He is God's uniquely anointed one, and he came to earth to serve those who were who were not really his people. And we talked very briefly about the fact that in eternity past, the Lord Jesus was was not a a Jewish man. He was the eternal God, the Son of God, the, the second person of the Trinity, as we sometimes say, but existing in that perfect deity, yet he entered the world and closely associated himself with people who were not eternally his own race. Uh, entered into life fully with them, serving them. So he becomes an example, and it's on that powerful truth that Paul builds part of his argument that we as the church ought to welcome one another, right? We receive one another, not because we line up on all of our views and opinions and background and, and you know, food choices and such. Uh, we welcome one another. That is, we open our hearts to one another and, and receive one another into our hearts For Christ's sake, Christ is the great unifier. He is the one that stands at the center of the church. Now, Paul begins to shift his his focus outward and, and really is calling the church to join him as he personally participates with Christ in this great mission uh, that the Lord has set before us. So let's look at the word. I'm going to read this portion all the way to the end of the chapter, and then we'll come back through and, and note some highlights. Romans 15, verse 14. The Apostle Paul writes, I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. But on some points I have written to you very boldly by way of reminder because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles in the priestly service of the gospel of God so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In Christ Jesus, then, I have reason to be proud of my work for God, for I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation, but as it is written, those who have never been told of him will see, and those who have never heard will understand." This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you once I have enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem, bringing aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it, and indeed they owe it to them. For if the, if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessings, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessings. When therefore I have completed this and have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Let's pray together. 
Father, we open the word with hope and expectation and pray that by your Spirit's close and personal ministry to us, we would understand it, that we would respond in obedience, in humble faith, with joy, and uh, that our lives would be changed by this living word. We ask your blessing over our nation and pray that you would bring your peace to rule and reign in every heart, that the power of the risen Christ would be poured out by the Spirit upon this land, and that those who do not know you would be brought into that deep and intimate and all-satisfying relationship with you through Christ, that you would bring a peace that is divine over this nation as the, as the Lord Jesus establishes his dominion in all of our hearts. And while we pray to that end, in particular, we pray that the Lord Jesus would establish his dominion in our hearts here at this moment. It is in his holy name we pray. Amen. I want you to go back to verse 14, and I know this is a, a, a longer passage, but we'll move through it pretty quickly here, I think, uh, without difficulty. Uh, and I want you to see, let me scroll through that again. Uh, I want you to notice, first of all, in the first couple of verses that, that there's a large point that I think some of these smaller uh, ideas that Paul is communicating could be captured with this little phrase, Christ matures his church for effective ministry. Look at what he says in verse 14. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers, that you yourselves are, and then he lists three things, full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to instruct one another. Now, how do those things tie in? Well, let's put it in its context. And remember, we've just completed that portion of, of his letter where from be the beginning of chapter 14 through verse 7 of chapter 15, he's been saying to them, oh, there's a problem here. And there were quarrels and divisions emerging, and some were saying we should never eat meat that might have possibly been offered to idols, and others were saying it's no problem, it's meat. God created meat. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Jesus declared all foods clean. Some were saying we, we, we should not participate uh, in uh, observing special holy days, and other people were saying they're all holy. And there were a variety of discussions and divisions even emerging, and, and Paul speaks very strongly to it and, and corrects uh, the, the judging that was going on. Uh, he corrects the despising of one another that apparently was taking place, but now he turns around and with, with quite remarkable tenderness says, I myself am satisfied about you. But there are things particularly in view, aren't there? First of all, that you yourselves are full of goodness. That idea of goodness has to do with an active goodness, a, a kindness, if you will, that is continually demonstrated. And I think it's appropriate for us, even at this moment in our own history, tying into the things that we touched on at the outset of the service with the Supreme Court uh, decision, other things that are unfolding for us culturally, that we too, as the Romans, be people who distinguish ourselves for our goodness, very closely on the heels, filled with all knowledge, that knowledge is the result of our spiritual perception, of our learning more and more of who Christ is, of what he has done, learning more and more of, of what the gospel is and how it comes to bear on all of life. And then finally, able to instruct one another. Now, the way that reads, it, it almost seems like, you know, anybody could stand up at any time and teach a class. There's more to it than just teaching in that sense. There's actually woven into this terminology, uh, and you see this in other places where the, where the term is used in, in writing such as this, that includes warning and admonishing. And that is certainly important to the health of the body. As we come together, that as we see things that are of concern, and especially when we open the Word of God and we, and we look at what the Lord clearly teaches and commands us to see a brother or sister who is, who is not living those things out in humble obedience, we ought to speak up. Paul even writes in Ephesians that the believers, such as we are, are called to expose the unfruitful works of darkness. There is a profound moment for us 
to be visible and vocal in expressing the gospel. And, and we have to elevate it above what, what is viewed uh, almost without question as just political differences. It is not a matter of politics for us that would dictate the value of life. It is tied to who our God is and what we believe about his uh, divine wisdom expressed in creation. It's tied to what we believe about ourselves as being created in his image. What a, div- what, what a remarkable privilege that is. So we, like the Romans, have an opportunity to demonstrate that we too are full of an active goodness. That we are, in fact, filled with knowledge. It doesn't mean we know everything, and God help us if we come across as arrogant, know-it-alls. It's not what we mean. It would not honor Christ, and it would not serve our neighborhoods and nation at this moment. Now, in the context of chapters 14 and 15, this really is a tender word of encouragement because the Romans would have, after reading that little portion of the letter, might have felt like, man, Paul doesn't even like us. It's clear he does, and he's confident in the grace of Christ as it continues to work. And despite their strong differences of opinion that posed real risk to their relationships in the gospel mission of the church in Rome, Paul says, I'm satisfied when I think of you. They're not a perfect church, and neither are we, but they are the Lord's church, called, equipped, and positioned by the Lord to do his work in a great city at that moment of of, of history, and so are we. Not perfect, but called, equipped, and positioned by the Lord for this moment right here in this setting. I'm so thankful for you. I'm so thankful for gospel hope. For these very things can be said about you. But in saying that, I would also encourage you, and I'm part of that, encourage us that we should not be content to rest where we are. We really have been afforded a most remarkable moment in human history to be on mission with Christ. Now look at verse 15. Because here we go into a section where Christ is preparing his church for effective global ministry. And some of the things that Paul speaks to in verse 15 are evidence of that and open the door for us to consider where he has uh, prepared us for effective global ministry. Notice verse 15. But on some points I've written to you very boldly by way of uh, of reminder. Now let me pause right there and add um, that what Paul is speaking of here is his awareness that God has given him grace. Look at the next phrase, because of the grace given me by God to be a minister of Christ Jesus. Um, it, it is interesting that, that he says, I think somewhat sweetly, I'm in agreement with, uh, with other authors who've noted this little point, I've written to you very boldly by way of reminder Doesn't that seem like a polite way when he's just coming out of a section where it's almost like, you people clearly don't understand some things. Now, he didn't say that, but you almost sense like they they needed a strong word of exhortation. But now there's a a gracious word, I think, uh, to them to encourage them. But pressing on from that, he is aware of the fact that it is, it is a grace gift, if you will, of God that he is a minister. And he uses a term here you shouldn't think of, you know, like preacher or pastor. He actually uses a term that's tied to temple worship uh, for a, a Jewish listener, a minister, one who leads sacred worship, but he's called to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. Now, once again, remember, he wasn't born a Gentile. That's not his community or neighborhood, so to speak. He's been given a measure of grace by God Almighty and positioned to serve, to lead in worship, if you will, people who are not like him, and he's not like them. What a thought it is that it is the purpose and desire of the Lord Jesus Christ to gather Gentiles under the sacred worship leadership of someone like Paul, and then in turn, look at the next phrase, to lead them in the priestly service of the gospel of God. 
so that the offering of the Gentiles may be acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Oh, there's so much that is going on here, but the Gentiles are not only going to participate in worship, but they themselves become a very precious offering to the Lord. There might be a little echo of what Paul said back in chapter 12, verse 1, where he said, I'm I am appealing to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice to God. That's the sacrifice that God's looking for this morning. He wants you. He wants you. He doesn't want the money out of of your purse or your wallet. He doesn't want lip service, a nod of the head, a tip of the cap, where it's kind of like, let's... Pause to remember the the man upstairs. No, he wants you offered to him. And so he's actually positioned Paul to be a voice of gospel proclamation so, so that as Gentiles hear that, they will respond in repentance and faith and enter into that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and become part of the great assembly of worshipers. I think Paul envisions the fulfillment of all kinds of Old and New Testament promises that the nations of the earth will come to Christ in repentance and faith. He's going to quote one in just a few more verses here, and so should we. We too ought to anticipate it. It's why we pray. It's why we share the gospel. It's why we plan outreach cookouts and we host plant camps and distribute Bibles and gospel literature and meet people for coffee and have guests into our home. We are all ministers of God to the nations. And it's the grace of God that creates that kind of vision for service and for ministry. And it reaches beyond the borders of our cultural experiences and backgrounds. A lot of us are transplants to Utah. Some of you thought it was a job that was moving you out here. And then you got here and realized, man, there's an amazing opportunity to serve the Lord in this place. Yeah, you, you think Jesus thought beyond where you could think? Others of you moved out intentionally just for gospel ministry and praise God for the generations who have preceded us and praise God for the generations who will come after us, but this generation needs to see it and commit fully to it. He gives grace to us for his work. Look at verse 17. He accomplishes his work through us. How astonishing. Paul goes on to say, in Christ Jesus and I have reason to be proud of my work for God. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience. It it reminds me of the opening of Acts. You have the four Gospels, and then you have the Acts of the Apostles, and Luke inserts a neat little phrase in there and, and, and says, basically, the things that Jesus began to do, which I wrote about in my first Uh, account, which is the Gospel of Luke, and and he gives a clear sense that even though Jesus is uh, uh, ascending from earth in chapter 1 and he leaves the disciples behind, this is the ongoing work of Jesus Christ, and I think there's an echo of that here very clearly given through Paul. Sometimes we despair and wonder, God, have you abandoned us? Why is life so hard? Why is there so much confusion? Why does evil seem to have the upper hand? Again, don't let what your physical eyes see confuse the greater spiritual realities of what the Lord Jesus really is doing. He is still on mission, and his plan is to use people like us to accomplish it. That term accomplish simply means to put something into effect fully. I I wish we could glimpse the throne room of heaven for just a few moments and to see the risen, ascended Christ ruling and reigning. There's never one moment where he pulls out, pardon me, but pulls out a divine handkerchief and mops his perspiring forehead, you know, in worry. Never one moment where he wrings his hands Oh, is this this plan going to work? Never one moment where he looks at a church like ours and says, those people are so pitiful. 
what was I thinking to assemble that group of losers? <laughs> now, we may feel like that. I mean, if we're honest, right? I do. There, there are days where I know that I haven't been obedient, fully consecrated. I, I mean, but the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't identify you in that way. Oh, sure, he, he knows the sin. That's why he disciplines us in love and corrects us and reproves us to, to get us back in the path. But astonishingly, we're the plan. And he's working that plan through us. So that's why we don't come together to boast about what we do. Just like Paul says, I, I'm, I'm not gonna brag and boast about what I've done. Now, I'm, I'm proud, but not in a sinful pride kind of way. He's proud of what he looks back on. He's amazed by it. You can hear it in his, in his tone as he writes this letter that Christ has accomplished some remarkable things. And what is Jesus seeking to accomplish through Paul and us? Well, that's to bring the Gentiles to obedience. That's the goal of Paul's ministry, and it needs to be the goal of ours. Obedience doesn't just mean that they conform their lives to the Ten Commandments. No, the obedience that Christ is actually seeking from Jew and Gentile alike is the obedience of faith. The obedience of submission that says, I am a sinner, and I, I sorrow what I've done and said, what I've even thought in the secret moments and God, I, I turn my back on that and I turn in faith to you because I see that in Jesus Christ is forgiveness for my sins. I see in Jesus there's the offer of eternal life. That's the obedience of faith. And that's what Paul has been working toward. And notice something else that emerges here at the end of verse 18 where he, he says not only has Christ accomplished things through me, but then he refers in verse 18 to word and deed, and then verse 19, by the power of signs and wonders, and then he says it straight up, by the power of the Spirit of God. You know, there's an echo again of what he touched on back in chapter 12 where, where Christ, by the Spirit, gifts every church, every individual, and then he brings that variety of gifts together for a specific purpose, for the edification of the body of believers, but also for the work of evangelism. And there were some unique gifts that were given to the apostles in those early days that were evidences of, of God's blessing on them and the presence of the Spirit. And Paul's just touching on his unique set of gifts, word and deed, the power of signs and wonders. And, and signs and wonders uh, would simply be standard biblical phraseology, as one author wrote, for miracles. God wanted people to know. I'm with these people. I'm in them, and the message they speak is true. So here is Christ not only giving grace for the work, not only accomplishing his purposes for the work, but empowering ordinary people. And look at the next phrase, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I fulfill the ministry of the gospel of Christ. That doesn't mean that every single person living from Jerusalem all the way around to, uh, again, what is modern day Albania, you know, has been converted. No, but because of the unique call upon Paul's life as a, as a frontline pioneer gospel minister, if you will, I mean, he has worked that region, been on multiple mission trips at this point, and, and evangelized and planted churches and, and appointed elders and, and nourished the church and strengthened it and left it in good hands. And he's looking at that, that region from the perspective of, of God's unique call upon his life and says, to the glory of God, I've done it. I'm gonna come back to this in a moment, but as we press on into verse 20, we come to a third big heading, and that is the worship of Christ is our ambition in ministry. Now, Paul describes a personal ambition here in verse 20. I make it my ambition to preach the gospel not where Christ has already been named. He says, this is my goal. This is the desire that consumes me to preach the gospel. You know, he uses a term that sometimes it... it it actually is uh, exercise or practiced in the sense that I'm preaching here today, but it's, it's broader than that. 
The terminology that he uses when you look at the book of Acts has to do with the, just the proclamation of the good news of who Jesus Christ is, what he has done, and what he promises yet to do. The whole church is involved in this kind of proclamation. Sometimes it happens publicly, sometimes it happens privately. It just means the bringing of the good news of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ to those who who need to hear. And then look at that little phrase, where Christ has, not where Christ has already been named. We still hear stories in our day of people who've never heard the name of Jesus Christ, and I think that is part of it, but beyond that, what Paul is really seeking and where some of the context of other passages helps to inform our understanding of this, it's not just enough that we, you know, we could just write Jesus on a billboard and stick it on I-15 and thousands upon thousands of people would see the word, hear the term, but does that mean they, they have heard Jesus named? No, because to name Jesus in the way Paul is writing of actually speaks of that act of faith and worship where we exalt him. We were doing it earlier in song. We've done it in the scripture readings. We're doing it right now as we open the word together. We're saying Jesus Christ is everything. He is our all and in all. He is the one who alone is worthy of all praise and honor and blessing. And Paul says, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel not where Christ is already being worshiped, but in places where he's not. Lest I build on someone else's foundation. Now, we should pause right here and, and ask the question, is Paul saying that all believers should do this kind of pioneer foundational ministry? I don't think so. I'm sure he's not, because in another letter that he wrote to the, to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 9, he says, Who then is Apollos, who is Paul? We are servants through whom you believed, and the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. It's also clear from other passages, like letters that he wrote to, to men like Timothy or Titus, that he'd appointed them, and he wanted them to stay long-term in places where he had either planted a church or helped to start it. And he recognizes his, his call as a pioneer, frontline church planter, missionary evangelist is, is unique. It's, it's not, he's not the only one to ever do it, but it's not the only game that Jesus calls us to. So I would be a... Uh, I, I would be misrepresenting the word of God to say all of us should be frontline pioneer types as Paul was, but some of you should be. There may be a young person here even who is just now beginning to think of what would Jesus want me to do with my life? Maybe he would actually want you to get a passport and move to the other side of the planet. and invest your life with people who are not your people, telling them about Jesus so that at some point they would name him as their Savior, Lord, and King. Some of you will follow the path of an Apollos. You will water what the pioneer planter did. Some of you will participate in other ways to support ministry. And as we work through this passage, you're going to see there are a variety of ways that, that we join together. So I don't think you, anyone can make a case to say that Paul's personal ambition should be everyone's personal ambition. No, look at verse 21. There's a scriptural motivation for all of us. And he's quoting Isaiah 52. As it is written, those who've never been told of him will see, and those who've never heard will understand. Now, oh, I love this passage. I have preached through it here before, um, and I may come back to it next week when we have all those plant campers with us. Um, this This is part of a larger servant song. The prophecy of Isaiah has four servant songs, at least as I was taught, and it, they are just certain Uh, songs that God gave Isaiah where he takes us right to Jesus. 
And Isaiah 52 precedes Isaiah 53, which most of you know really well. That is one of the most precious passages in all the Old Testament, for there it displays the crucified, suffering Savior for us, doesn't it? But you can't separate chapter 52 from chapter 53. It really flows together, and it is one of those places where the chapter division is unfortunate. If you back all the way up to verse 13 of chapter 52, Isaiah calls us, through the inspiration of the Spirit, to behold God's servant. And then he says, the servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up and shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you. Now he's, he's turned the focus to this servant. His appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So shall he, and I think the ESV made a less, it, it's, a, it's a good choice, but there's a better choice that could be made. Uh, they use the term sprinkle, but I think with many others that the term startle would be better. So shall he startle many nations. That is, his suffering is just unimaginable. It's startling to see him so terribly abused. Now look at the effect here in verse 15. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which has not been told them they see, and that which they have not, under, not heard they understood. And then Isaiah goes into the famous, who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And if I skip over a couple of verses to that staggering, precious portrayal, this servant was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. We didn't regard him, we didn't value him. But now Isaiah says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him to be stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. That, that is, we, we looked at the cross, and some of you may look at the cross in the same way today and say, what's going on there? Like, that guy must have done something really horrible that he would die such a terrible, humiliating death. That's what Isaiah means when he says, we esteemed him to be stricken and smitten by God. But here's the truth of what was taking place on the cross. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The discipline that won, our peace was placed upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. See, that's what stands at the center of the gospel mission and isn't it interesting that Paul, writing this letter to the Romans in the first century, reaches back almost 800 years to a prophecy given to a, an Old Testament prophet he had never met named Isaiah, and he looks at that very passage and sees two lines of an eternal, unchangeable promise that those who have never heard, those who've never been told will see, and those who've never heard will understand. And he says, as he looks at his map, and I, he doesn't record this, but this is, this is where I think it, something like this happened. He looks at his map and says, God has given me fruitful ministry from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, and I praise Jesus for what he has accomplished through me. It's amazing to look back on that, but there's a promise that has yet to be fulfilled in a place we know as Spain. I'm going from this region there because God said through Isaiah 800 years ago these things would happen. Is that crazy? Parents, would you ever disciple your child in that way? The Bible open? Or would you lay out educational tracts and financial plans and say, well, son, if you, know, you can save $12,000 and buy your plane ticket and you know, be wise to go and start that IRA now and investing because you know, as bad as things are, you, you still need to be thinking about the future. And I'd feel a lot better if you'd wait until after school to, you know, do this and that. And, and let's talk about marriage and family. And, you know, your mom really wants grandkids. And so, actually, I would not encourage you to go to Mongolia because we won't be able to see the grandbabies. That's how most of us think. And I get it.
But don't you think we ought to open our Bibles at some point? And consider the mission that we've been called to participate in? And say, I may not be a frontline pioneer type like Paul, but maybe I'm a home front watering Christian. I, Lord, what do you want me to water? And as you listen to your kids talk, and they go back into children's ministry, that can be a dangerous place. Because Pastor Daniel and a whole bunch of others are reading the missionary stories, opening the word, and they're going to come out and they'll be like, have you, Mom, have you ever heard about Amy Carmichael? Wow. And your heart flutters a little bit. She's like, I'm glad for you to know the story, but don't get any notions in your head. No, fuel those notions. Fuel them with promises out of passages like Isaiah 52. Because the blood that Jesus shed matters. And the blood that Jesus shed is part of the great divine amen to the promises. That's why they're going to be fulfilled. Because God the Father made some promises to God the Son in eternity past, verified by the Holy Spirit, signed in his blood, the new covenant in his blood. And Paul staring at this passage going, if God said that and Jesus did that and the Spirit dwells in me doing this stuff, then I can go. Wow. But you don't have to go to Mongolia, necessarily. We work together in stuff that's right in front of us and trust him for the unknown future. Look at verse 22. This is the reason why I've so often been hindered from coming to you, but now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I've longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain and to be helped on my journey there by you. So the Romans... The Romans aren't being left out of this. They're in a, a strategic position. And that position at that moment has to do with helping Paul on the journey. So it's clear, God doesn't expect the whole church at Rome to you know, jump in the ship with Paul and sail west in the Mediterranean and then go evangelize Spain. Maybe some of them would have, but what Paul's asking them to consider doing is just help me on my journey. By the way, that's exactly what we're doing with some of our mission partners, and Dan and Christine Grings are good, the, uh, two of them, Dan and Christine Grings are gonna be here August 14th, and some of you have never met them uh, or been able to hear an in-person report on what God is doing through their ministry in the Congo, but they're coming, and we're gonna take up a love offering for them that day, so you can go ahead and just start thinking and praying about that. That will help them on their gospel journey. And then Paul says, once I've enjoyed your company for a while. And then look at verse 25 very quickly. He says, at present, however, I'm going to Jerusalem bringing aid to the saints. And then he walks through how the, the churches in Macedonia and Achaia have made a contribution for the poor. So there's, a, there's one of those works of goodness that he's doing to relieve the poor. It's not all about frontline gospel evangelism. That's important to him, but he's multitasking, really, and so can we. And let's cut very quickly. I know I'm leaving some stuff on the table here, but verse 30, there's a final appeal. By our Lord Jesus Christ, that's the authority of his appeal, and by the love of the Spirit, that's the basis of the appeal, but here it is, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. So do you see the oppor multiple opportunities the church at Rome has to bless Paul, to participate with him? Uh, they can participate in the, the relief offering he's collecting for the poor back in Jerusalem. They can encourage him as he's about to launch into the unknowns of Spain, and they can strive together with him. And he uses a word that is translated other places to mean engage in conflict, to struggle in an athletic contest. And prayer of this kind is taxing. But he's saying, please, strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. And you can read in the next two verses the particulars of what that striving would be centered on. But this, this is the heart of Paul, and it is given that we might learn from it and cultivate that same kind of heart. And it's not ultimately about, for Rome, it's not ultimately about participating with Paul in mission. It's ultimately about the church at Rome and Paul participating with Jesus Christ who remains on mission. And that's what he is calling us into. 
So as we think it through, there's an old picture from one of the plant camps you can see on the screen, or the, the screen within the screen. Uh, that, that's a shot that we took four years ago, 2018. That's Will Gawkin. Plant camps rolling in this week. Last I heard, 100 students and sponsors are coming. I don't know how many youth groups that, or churches that represents. We'll find out at the end of the week. Um, but we have an opportunity. This is us. This is, don't think of plant camp as something somebody else does. We do this. But you know what? We, we need to back up one step. Are you personally in a relationship with Christ to know the forgiveness of sins, uh, the indwelling presence of the Spirit, the gifts that, that he gives uh, that would truly position you to participate? Because if you've never repented of your sins and put your faith in Jesus Christ, you can go through the motions, but it, it, it's not going to be effective. Jesus will not call you into his mission until you first hear his call to come to him for salvation. Have you done that? And friend, if you're here today saying, didn't see that one coming, but no, the answer to that question is no, I'm not in a personal relationship with him. Well, you can be today. You can call to him from your heart at this moment. Jesus, I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness. I need your gift of eternal life. You don't even have to verbalize that so the people around you could hear that just from your soul, a sincere expression of faith. Building on that, though, there's a second question. Are you seeking to be on mission with Christ? You say, yes, I, I'm in a relationship with him, but is it possible you're very distracted at this moment or maybe indifferent? You're like, eh, that's for other people. I'm, after all, I'm no Paul. Well, welcome to the club. There's only one Paul who's ever lived. It's not about are you another Paul. It's who are you in Christ and, and what specific role does he have for you? Are you seeking to be on mission with Christ? Specifically, where are you planning to join Gospel Hope in the coming weeks? There are a ton of opportunities in front of us. Wish you could be at all of them, but know that you have a life outside of the church, and that's by God's design too, so no apologies necessary. It's always sweet to me when people come and like, oh, Danny, I, I really want to be there, but my work shift just changed. And I'm like, that's great. Don't, the Lord knows. Now, if you told me that you were going to binge watch some series on Netflix all weekend long, I would say, could we talk? Really? You're going to squander your precious time in that way and, and at the same time neglect a great opportunity? So the, one of the neat things, though, is in, similar to the spirit of what you know, Paul says here, and I will come back to these verses, uh, in that appeal uh, to pray. Verse 32, he says, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. We, we have that opportunity for our guests who are coming to refresh them, even though they think they're coming to refresh us, and they will. But let's just go ahead and like gear up to refresh them. So look for opportunities to bless, to thank, uh, to just encourage them as they pour into our church in the coming week. Well, that's a very different way to conclude a, a sermon um, but practically speaking, we need to think in terms of where am I with Jesus? Am I seeking to be on mission with him? And where am I planning to join our, our precious little family here in the coming weeks? Let's pray together. God, would you take your word and seal it to our hearts and bless us in Christ. Um, and bless us as Paul prayed at the end of this passage that you, the God of peace, would be with us all. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.